Well, hello, everybody. Very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon where in the world you're joining us from. Welcome to Live from the Ranch. My name is Ken Ramirez, and joining me today is our co-host, Juliana DeWillems from JW Dog Training and Behavior in the Washington, D.C. area. Hi, Juliana. How are you doing today? I'm great, Ken. It's hard to believe we're in the last main month of the summer. Can you believe it? <laughs> I know it's August already. It's hard it's to August. believe. But of course, uh, as I look at the weather, everybody around the country seems to be experiencing some some pretty warm weather. But I'm very fortunate up here in the Pacific Northwest, we have still had some pretty cool weather. So that's 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 really nice. You're very lucky. <laughs> and I'm really excited. We have a, a, a wonderful episode planned for today. Uh, uh, my guest is going to be Sarah McLeodry. But before I introduce her, I wanted to talk a little bit about something I think we're both excited about, and that's the fact that Clicker Expo is coming up really, really soon. It, it's actually not until January that the first expo comes in, but registration is opening up in just two weeks. So I always like to say if you're an animal training professional or enthusiast, and I assume if you're here watching the broadcast, you must be, you don't want to miss out on our Clicker Expo conferences. These events are the perfect opportunity to improve your skills, connect with one another, stay up to date on the latest techniques, and learn from some of the most respected positive reinforcement teachers and trainers in the world. Our first Clicker Expo will be Clicker Expo Live. That's our virtual conference taking place January 26th, 27th, and 28th of 2024. And then Clicker Expo Portland, Oregon is our in-person conference, and that will be April 5th, 6th, and 7th of 2024. And between the two programs, they are totally different. Unique programming. You could come to both expos and get a totally different experience. We want to encourage you to catch the early bird savings, which begins on August 17th. That's just a couple of weeks from now. So you can learn more at clickerexpo.clickertraining.com. I'm excited about Clicker Expo this year. It, uh, last year was our first year being in person again. And this year we're going to be in person in April and uh, virtual in um in April, I mean, virtual in January. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. And you're going to be at both of them, aren't you? I'm so excited. It's hard to believe we're here again, but man, I am counting down the days. Well, well good. Well, I want to want to start our program by introducing our, our guest today, Sarah McLeodry. She is the founder and owner of uh, Decisive Moment Pet Consulting. Uh, she specializes in care with consent, which we often call cooperative care. Um, she also specializes in a variety of behavioral struggles and aggression, helping senior dogs to thrive uh, and living with intact dogs. Sarah is a certified dog behavior consultant, a fear-free certified professional, a, a pet end-of-life doula, a fit paws master trainer, and she's tag teach certified. So she's very experienced in lots of different areas. Since 2001, Sarah has been uh, competing with positively trained dogs in retriever field tests, high level competition and rally obedience confirmation and elite level nose work. She now lives in Portland, Oregon and she joined Synergy Veterinary Behavior where she was instrumental in expanding their behavior modification services and mentoring the growing team of trainers there. And for Sarah, she says, it is inspiring to help continue and promote this growth mindset for fellow trainers, behavior consultants, and pet guardians. And even though Sarah's behavior consulting practice focuses on complex and sometimes dangerous behavior struggles, she is known for being fun, creative problem solving, joy, and laughter. And she adds that to all of her classes and sessions. She's an optimist at heart, a perpetual Pollyanna, I like that term, and uh, loves teaching clients and letting them know that they have the power. They are their dog's magic wand. With that, welcome, Sarah, to the broadcast. I'm so glad you're here. How are you today? Good. The Pacific Northwest has been treating us very well. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to plug Absolutely. Portland, Oregon Whether for Clicker Expo in May. It is delightful in Portland in May, or in April, sorry. Yes, yes, it's going to be uh, early April that we'll be there at, in Portland. So I tell you what, before we jump into some of the topics you want to discuss, I would love it if you could share with our, our viewers who may not know you a little bit about your background and particularly where in your life did you suddenly get an interest in 
dogs and animals and training? Has that always been a part of your life since a child? Or was there some moment that sort of brought you to, to being with animals and being a trainer? My mother always said that I came out wanting to ride horses and we were not a horse family. Um, so I, by, by age seven, I was riding uh, English hunter jumpers. And then I was promised a dog by the time I was nine and trained him through the 4-H program, which was literally a book. I took no classes, but I figured if I could train a horse, I could train my dog and um, grew from there. In college, I started doing, I was dogless because I was in college and I started doing a, a photography project. I have my degrees in photography about a service oh, dog okay. organization. And that service dog organization, I started um, doing some fostering for them. And I also did eventually get my own little border collie Kelpie mix. Um, I had a very open dog campus that we at uh, the school I went to and really got into training there. And then um, started dating my now husband who was uh, had a service dog. And he unfortunately had a lot of behavior, behavioral struggles as did my little border collie. And that led us to a veterinary behaviorist and uh, to deal with his dog dog reactivity and hopefully save my husband's life because literally he pulled him into traffic in Bethesda, Maryland into the back of a car once. So um, we needed help and I didn't know any better. And so that was what started it. I didn't know that little appointment to Dr. Karen overall in uh, 1999 was going to change the trajectory of my life. Wow, well, that that's that's fascinating to hear how that happened, and and to to connect with someone like Dr. Karen Overall, who is yeah. so well respected and well known in the field. You 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 made a really good connection there. And I I, I my next question was going to be, how did you get interest in 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 cooperative care? But it sort of sounds like that was a natural fit. Uh, and 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 is that something you've always specialized in? Well, no, I would say um, when I in 2010, I um, got my first American Water Spaniel and so far only um, American Water Spaniel a dog named Rizzo. And at 10 weeks old, she was going to be my confirmation dog. I was planning on doing competition obedience with her. And about 10 weeks old, I was doing some you know basic puppy grooming and she bit me, not just like a puppy bite. She bit me. And I went, ooh. I'm planning to plan on showing this dog in confirmation. How am I going to have strangers handle her? And so I taught her this beautiful chin rest that made it look like, and she had a really pretty head. So everybody just always thought I was presenting her gorgeous head and trying to avoid the judge looking at her not so great front. Um, but I had a beautiful chin rest where then we could show off her bite and show off her pretty head. And little did they know it was really to give her something to do to focus on in the confirmation ring. Um, and I got really lucky because I, I actually took the week long class at the shed um, when she was a puppy too. So that I got that. And um, so she really taught me about it. And then I was so great, grateful because she had a lot of health issues as she grew up. She had uh, pretty horrible allergies and lots of body handling. And then as she aged, she had cognitive dysfunction and um, had had a stroke and things like that. So we had to do lots of physical care with her. And it just made, especially when we got to the end of life, we don't think about that when dogs are young, but right. it, I was so grateful that she had so much training in her when we got towards the end there. Um, and she was so cooperative with all of her care. Yeah, I think one of the things that's challenging, I know for me when I work with uh, with the general public, there there isn't a big drive often for them to want to do medical training. It's only usually when they have a chronic ongoing problem where they need to get medication on a regular basis mm -hmm. or some kind of regular care that they go, oh, this would be so much easier if 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 I trained it. Um, do you do you actually market? To, to the general public uh, that you, mm -hmm. you take on cooperative care cases or is that does it just sort of come up when it's necessary? No, I heavily, I mean, it, when I decided to step away from Synergy, that was going to be my main focus. And um, mainly because when I, at, when I was at Synergy Veterinary Beha Behavior, we only could see clients that were patients and the dogs that were already working with the veterinary behaviorists. And there's a lot of dogs who don't have a lot of other problems other than in you know, grooming, body handling, things like that. And so they weren't necessarily needing to see a veterinary behaviorist 
but they still were having these struggles. And so I was, that was my goal was to get it more out to the masses and to realize that it can be fun and it can be no different than teaching tricks. And that's why I've started this whole care with consent tricks concept. Well, that, that's great because I wanted to ask you about that. I know oftentimes when I work with people in the zoological community where I do a lot of consulting, one of the big challenges that comes when we do medical training is we're successful at training it, but then the the person who's working with the animal, they're so serious and they're so focused and they're so concerned that their behavior changes so much that, that the behavior the behavior of their animal falls apart. And I really love the fact that one of the things that you look at is you you talk about cooperative care from the perspective of having fun and making it enjoyable. And and it, it was that an approach that you always took to doing cooperative care? Did that sort of come to you later as you saw some of the challenges that people were facing? I, I think it came to me a little bit later. And I think it comes from my obedient, my competition obedience background. And because I would, you know, you'd see in competition obedience, you train all these skills and you get in the ring and your nerves and your worry. And it, all of a sudden it would just be like, everything would, like you said, everything would just kind of fall apart. And so I already had that concept from that world. And I started watching, you know, my clients where we, as soon as we'd go into the clinic, the, the dogs and the people would be like, <gasps> and I'm like, okay, we got to back this up a little bit and make it fun again. Well, that, that 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 makes sense, and and I would assume that that if you start taking that approach of 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 making training fun, which I I always think is a good idea for all training, but it could come in handy for more than just veterinary work, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah. and uh, one of my clients actually I saw this week was stop, um, I was out on a walk, and we've been working on some paw handling games. And she noticed her dog limping on the walk and was able to stop in the middle of a walk and do their little peekaboo and get look at his paw, which was great. Like, because it ended up being not like there was like a little rock stuck in there, but it wasn't a big deal. She was really worried that he had hurt himself and she wouldn't have been able to do that two months ago. Yeah, that's, 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 that's really, really great. Um, do you, do you, do you have a lot of groomers that that also find ways of using the, that fun approach to training to to help them with what they do? I wish we could get more groomers going. Um, it is helpful that the, on the Fear Free uh, certification, they do now have a grooming certification. Um, groomers' jobs right. are very hard. And um, it's, it's really challenging trying to balance getting the job done and not upsetting the client, giving them back a half half groomed dog. Um, I do all of my own grooming, and I, and I'm okay with one day having one ear done and the other ear not, or you know. Think, and when I'm working with clients right. to teach them how to groom at home for that reason, I'm like, you may have a funny looking dog for a little while, but we're gonna go at your dog's pace. And that's really hard as a professional groomer to to be able to do that. But we're getting there. Um, I have a young groomer who's working with me with her own dog. And I just, it's so exciting to see the younger generation coming through um, that just have a very different philosophy on things. So, so when you start, when you start thinking about wanting to train medical behaviors or wanting to get somewhere and you, you want to make it fun, how do you begin with a client? What are you, what are you, what is this, what are your suggestions when it comes to getting started with? With, I'm assuming you don't jump right into let's train these animals to give us blood. I assume there must be some <laughs> one more more accessible approach that you take. Yeah, so I have a like I've actually even moved a lot away from even teaching a chin rest right away. I used to, that used to be like my first go to chin rest was you know the end all be all, and for a lot of dogs standing there with a, doing a chin rest can be really hard for them. They just, they don't feel they can move and it's, it's a little challenging. And for clients that come in that don't have a lot of training skills, it's a little tricky for them to train it sometimes. So I'm looking at always both sides of it, of where are my client skills at and how can I build skills? So I'm, you know, a lot of times I'll do, we'll work on paw handling because most people have taught their dogs to give paw. But what they teach is they teach a quick little tippy tappy give paw. 
of like my right. paw goes in and, they, and, they, and so we'll work really fast on a duration paw target and we'll start working. Right. So that's something that the dog maybe already knows, maybe the client already figured out how to train on their own and how can we build on something that they've already had success with. Um, and then my other foundation <laughs> skill is no grabbing treats. So I do a lot with like treats very open and out um, so that th people have an extra hand. And so we do a lot of just like kind of impulse control around what I call the chili bowl, which is just a bowl with our treats in it, but so that we have an extra set of hands. Well, one of the things that you brought up that I, I would love to explore, I wanted to ask you about is ever, I always find people going, I have no trouble teaching this behavior, but I have no idea how to get duration. And you were just yes. talking about the fact that you do that quick paw touch. And one of the first things you work on is duration. What is your approach for teaching duration? How do you approach that with someone who has the behavior, but only has this really brief version of the behavior? It is, I would say that is the hardest part of cooperative care by far. Um, and it also is obviously dog, as our every trainer says, our favorite, it depends. Um, but for paw targeting and specifically, it's actually pretty easy is I always tell people load up your hand with food. And as soon as that paw goes on, you start feeding a really rapid, long duration food feeding. And then you take your hand away before the dog takes their paw away. And so your removal of the hand becomes the end of the behavior instead of them taking their paw away. It also still gives them the ability to take their paw away to stop if, they, if we need a stop signal, but we, they start to learn, oh, I can keep it there until you take it away. So the, the, the taking the hand away becomes the cue for the dog that, that it's over and that yep. thus allows you to potentially extend the length. Yep. I like I like that. That's creative. It, that, that might not work with all types of, of, of duration, but it would make a lot of sense for the yeah. for the paw one. And then and then you were you you're the, the you were talking about the, the, the second thing uh, uh, that you trained. I just went out of my head. What was that? The chili bowl. Oh yes, the chili bowl. You 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 said uh, you you keep it you keep it out there in the open, um, and what you call impulse control, I assume, is the, yeah, the I, idea I of <laughs> not wanting to jump into the into the bowl right. and, and having the restraint to wait until you give it. And how yeah. do you go about teaching that? Because I think that's an interesting thing that is a dilemma for some people. Yeah, and so I always have a a, a little cup or a bowl that I can put my hand over if I need to. It is different than Shared Patel's. Um, bucket game where at the bucket game, they're, you know, looking at it. This is just, it's there and it should be a non event. Like I just want it to be there as an extra piece. And we start with just, I hold it and I start feeding from it and then we'll make work on a down and I feed and we slowly build to, can I have this on the ground and can you stay relaxed and laying down? And it's always there. Um, I love this particular one because it fits in the little cubby of the climb. <laughs> So I can put it right on my climb, um, as does pint size um, mason jars do too. Um, so I just, you know, and, and we've all seen that with our clients where they're just, you know, they've got the plastic bag or they're trying to deal with their treat right. pouch or cookies in their pocket or they drop food and the dog goes immediately for it. And I just want to make that this, it's there. It's just easy to get that treat and give that treat. It's not a big deal but the dogs aren't helping themselves. Right. So you, you basically start out where it's not even accessible and not even really exactly. tempting to them, get right. them comfortable doing other things and then approximate it down where yeah. it's perhaps in their, in their, in their range of being able to get to, but they're no longer, they, they've already learned some alternative. Yeah. And learning so. that the treats are going to come from here. They, so even if I'm wearing a treat pouch, they're coming from here instead of elsewhere. Gotcha. Well, that's 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 really great. Well, I would love to get a in a few minutes. I'm going to ask you to do a demonstration with your own dog, but I also wanted to let everybody know that one of the things that I'm excited about is that you're going to be offering a live course with us at KPA uh, on fun type of cooperative care. So let me take a quick break and tell everybody about that course. And then I want to ask you about what you're planning to do in that course. It is one of our KPA live virtual courses. Uh, 
those are classes that are usually from four to six weeks long. They feature real-time training and coaching with fabulous teachers like Sarah. And uh, the classes take place on Zoom and they incorporate a well-structured video-based curriculum uh, that sort of guides you through each week. And one of our upcoming classes is called But First Fun, Cooperative Care Training with Sarah McLeodry. Um, and what that will, that particular class is going to open up for enrollment at the end of the month on August 30th. So you can get more information at karenpryoracademy.com or you can stay tuned and we're going to talk about it right now. Um, so um, tell me a little bit about this class. I, I, it's, it's a four week class, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And what, yep. what is, what is your, what are you hoping that the learners come away from of the class having learned? Well, we start out with just some foundation skills of feet on things and enjoying that interaction, learning how to interact with novel objects. And then we build it to specific skills. And I like to take everyday household objects and turn them into training props. And so we have um, exercises that we do where you're gonna get out your cookie sheets for, instead of baking, we're gonna teach our dogs to stand still on them as if it's a scale. Because it's hard to mimic a scale at home if it's shiny and a little slick, but cookie sheets work perfectly or putting aluminum foil over a piece of cardboard works great. And so how can we come up with these games um, with just stuff that we have around the house that also to takes the pressure off. If I say, go train that scale right now. And you're like, yeah, my dog doesn't get on the scale. There's a lot, people go into that kind of that stiff mode again. And it's like, just train your dog to stand on the aluminum foil or the cookie sheet. And so when I first taught the first round, I taught this class, I had a client's dog who um, at the site of the, uh, their recovery collar, their cone, the dog would flee and if they tried to pursue would have aggressive behaviors. And one of my challenges in class is the last week is to teach your dog to wear various headgear of whatever. So we'll, we'll, we're gonna show that in a second. But, um, and she got her dog to wear bunny ears by the end of the class. And because it was just funny and silly and it didn't matter if it, if she couldn't get it fully trained, it wasn't a disaster. Right, and the best right. part about that particular you know, dog is when that dog's ears would go up bigger than the bunny ears that she trained it to wear. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I remember uh, there was a, a, a person who I knew who was really very anti having their dogs dressed up and stuff, but 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 then they met a dog who learned to dress up and found that that dog was then very comfortable being touched all over yes. its head and being touched mm -hmm. everywhere. And, and and that's kind of what you mean by you can make something fun, but that yes. fun training ends up being something that you can utilize yeah. for lots of other things besides just dress up. And I think that's yeah. pretty cool. So who who is this course designed for? Is it for beginners? Is it for experienced trainers? Is it for Anybody who's just interested in, in, in learning about medical care? It definitely is for anybody. I, my goal is a, it's a gateway into cooperative care for clients that maybe are interested, but have a little bit of training, but are beginners. Um, and it's also really great, I think, for our professionals to take, to give you uh, some new ideas of how to maybe incorporate cooperative care into your basic manners classes. You know, all of a sudden, if you're teaching a, you know, a shake behavior, starting to look at it from a cooperative care perspective. And so things like that. So I think it's on both ends of the spectrum. I, I do look at cooperative care a little bit differently. And so I think it'll just give people some fresh perspectives on, on it. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I cooperative care is something that I focused on a lot in my career, and I already hearing and seeing things that I think I would get value from. So as a professional trainer, I can see it being valuable, but it is appropriate for a, oh. a pet parent just to take yep. a course like this as well, right? Yeah, that, like I want, that's why we put like, I like, it's tricks. It's really a tricks class. And as soon as you say the word tricks, people are like, oh, I can train tricks. I know how to do that. And so that's what I really wanted them to realize is it's all just tricks. 
and that's fun. And I and I, I think a lot of people enjoy training tricks, and and I think that can be a, a fun kind of thing. I I, w- I wondered if I could impose upon you to say, could you could you give us some examples and maybe show some of the types of training that you'll be working on with your dog? Your dog's name is Lindy, right? Yes, she is currently out sunning herself in the dog yard because it is beautiful here today. Lindy, she's like, yes, let's go. All right, we're going to, I think, switch cameras so I can. Yes, okay, All right. great. All right, so we had talked about doing, oh, let me push my chair out of the way. Um, the head in things. So one of the first things I teach is head in things. And head in things, the idea being that if you can teach your dog to put their head in a thing, it could be a cone, it could be a muzzle, it could be lots of different things. And so we take just random stuff from around the house, yes, and work on can we put our head in things, yes. And so obviously Lindy has played this game a lot, so she has no problem. (laughs) She's like, oh, should we retrieve it? Yes, good job. So that's just a random little, it was like a shelf thing that I had. Um, when my puppy was young, we have a dog door and she yes, could not figure out how to use the <laughs> dog door. So I made a fake dog door because she was afraid to stick her head through the dog door. Oh, got a swallow. All right. So let, so I this is what we did for dog door. So not cooperative care, but still the idea of like if your dog learns to stick their head in things, they can learn how to use a dog door. And so we just added a little flap to it and worked on getting dog in flap she's like sure i'll keep doing she that. has no she has no yes. hesitancy does she She's really she eager to do that yes yes and so it even could just be a toy that you have around your house yes good girl this is actually a new item she has never seen this item so i just got this one yes good so that was really i liked because she stuck her head in a little deeper And so this is a great little, you know, muzzle, but not a muzzle. Oh, now we're retrieving it. So we got to be careful about that. So there we go. Yes. Good girl. Good job. And that's really, that's really tight around her head, but she doesn't mind going in there. That's really excellent. Nope. Yep. And this is how we start with muzzle training. Good girl. You know, and so it doesn't have to be fancy. Like it, it's, you know, I grabbed... This is a lunch bag I have. Yes. <laughs> and it's like, what silliness can we do? And so I did bring, oh, and Lindy has to wear a bib when she has a food toy. So we've been working on putting on her ridiculous dinosaur bib because uh, she makes a mess because she has a, a molar missing. Can you show them how cute and ridiculous you look in your bib? Yes, good. And so she pulls out there. And that's fine. I want her to know that she can pull out. She doesn't need to, you know, she doesn't have to. But if I was working on trying to get her to put her head all the way through, you miss the hole. There you go. And I all I have to do is feed here. But I also am letting her pull out if she's not quite ready to stay in there. And so this becomes the practical application of the same skill. <laughs> and really... You know, your dog wearing a dinosaur bib is about as cute as funny as it gets. There you go. But I also like the fact that when she earlier, when she wanted to pull out, she had that ability. She has that freedom. Definitely. All right. You want bunny ears? Are you trying to retrieve them? Yes. And so this one I've actually worked on is hold still instead of her putting her head in. So you saw how she just holds still as I get closer. She just backed her head away, totally allowed to take away. Yes, good job. Right. Good job. Back up. Yes. Oh, and they're falling off. Good. Um, So yeah, so we have a lot of different silly things. Little glasses. Those don't stay on as well. And then the other thing too um, is one of my clients recently was having a lot of scale issues. And so we worked on teaching the dog to go in a box, 
in a chewy box because whenever chewy delivers stuff, you know, it's long and skinny and, <laughs> and then they brought their box to the vet. And so the dog saw its chewy box on the scale and knew how, knew this game. And so it was totally fine. and didn't even think about the scale because the chewy box was there. So they had practiced it at home. Let me get my little potato board out here. Oh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think Lytton, there's not a better uh, uh, testament to doing this than watching the eagerness that Lindy takes has for doing these things, Sarah. I mean, she really is enthusiastic. Yeah, and so Lindy is five years old, and she ha this is how, because I've been doing this now long enough, she is, this is how she's grown up. She knows no different. And once again, it's that really, I'm very, very thankful because she now has bilateral hip dysplasia and needs week, uh, weekly injections of Adequin and lots of medication and all of it is cooperative. So scale, oh, I know that this doesn't look, she's like, this is not my scale. Can you come in? All right, fine, you can. She's like, wait, you cued me scale and that is definitely not a scale. She knows how to get on the scale at the vet office, no problem. So, and the cue, I, I always, people always ask me like, what's your cue? And I'm like, my cue is scale so that I remember what it is. <laughs> Good job. Well, I love the, I love the creativity you use. I can see where, where thinking about just these other ideas of, of, focusing on a scale or focusing on just getting in and outside of something like the chewy box that, that you, you have around the house all the time and how easy that would be to transfer it to the veterinary office, right. I think is terrific. There you go. One last one. We just got a new hat. There you go. New hat. Yeah. So, and my, I will say my young, my puppy, my uh, nine, almost nine month old, she is definitely a little more suspicious so uh, we're working, but that's also why it's so important to start working on these things young is because I need to make sure that she's comfortable with all that handling and everything. And I clearly sure. need a napkin now. Lindy thinks that getting really frothy while training is the best way to train. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is, oh, this is terrific. I love and I the demo say, like, and all, I love watching. All it is was binder clips too. Like, just simple binder clips to hold that on. There's none of this. I mean, well, maybe not everybody keeps bunny ears in their house, um, but otherwise <laughs> all of this stuff is just normal stuff either from around my house or from the dollar store. And so in the class, are you going to be taking people through how to teach these things specifically or are yes. you going to take a more broader approach? Of, and, no, and do you, do you, do you tend to recommend one specific technique for training? In other words, do you are you somebody who really says, hey, a target training is the way to go or shaping is the way to go or luring is the way to go? No. Or do you sort of keep it open? I definitely techniques? keep it open. I also talk a lot. I do a lot of what I call a, it's a combo between shaping and luring. Of We do a little bit of shaping and then we add the treats to do some, I call it power steering. So sometimes you just like with the, um, where's your bib? With the bib is a good example where like, I might shape her to get her head in the hole, but then I might use some, I call it my power steering options of, you know, I need that head to come all the way through. Um, so definitely, yeah. Um, so, so you said you might, you might shape the idea of the dog moving toward the, the, yes. the bib, but then use yeah. the luring to get the yes. forward thrust through the bib. Yep, to get all the way through like that. Good job. All right. I'm going to give her some entertainment because otherwise she will not stop training, as you can see. Um, and then we can well, sit we, down. We've I got to tell you, we've enjoyed watching you train. That's been great. I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you a few seconds to, to yes. get her entertained and then come on back. And I'm going to take a quick break. First of all, I want to remind all of you that are watching, if you have questions for Sarah in this next segment, we will be happy to take your questions about anything that, that she's been talking about. And meanwhile, I just wanted to quickly remind everybody that at Karen Pryor Academy, 
we sort of take an innovative approach to developing and supporting outstanding positive reinforcement trainers. Uh, we combine online learning with hands-on coaching from some of the most experienced teachers in the field. So if you're interested in becoming a certified professional dog trainer, we encourage you to check out one of our 20 plus upcoming locations uh, for the dog trainer professional program. And you can apply today by going to karenpryoracademy.com. On the screen, you can see some of the locations that are coming up in the next several months. Registration is uh, 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 is open for those. Uh, Columbus, Minneapolis, uh, Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, Ontario, Canada, all sorts of locations. And there are many other locations as well. So if you're interested in that, look into it, go to karenpryoracademy.com. I think you'll be pleased that you did. So Sarah, I wanted to come back and say, first of all, really enjoyed watching that session, loved watching the enthusiasm that uh, that uh, Lindy showed for the training, which just anytime a dog is having fun, I just, it's, it's how can you not enjoy it? It's, it's just yes. great to see her so yes. enthusiastic. Um, uh, I, I'm now kind of, of, of challenged. I feel like uh, I'm one of those people who who doesn't like to see my dogs all dressed up, but my wife really likes doing it. And so I'm I'm sure that uh, that that she's going to say, "See, it really serves a purpose." Um, so, it really um, does. I will uh, say, uh, but the biggest purpose actually, when Lindy was spayed, um, unfortunately she had some uh, some pretty major complications and almost died. Um, and she had uh, really bad rashes on her front legs from the surgical sites. And so she had to wear a long sleeve t-shirt in addition to like a little jumper. So she didn't have to wear a cone, which was great. But like, if she wasn't comfortable wearing all that clothing, it would have, she would have been in a cone. And so it was, it really does have practical applications. Putting booties on your dog has practical applications. Well, that's 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 great. Now, I understand, of course, that that another one of your specializations or one of the things you do a lot of working with is with aggressive dogs and and, and difficult cases. Um, do you find uh, it, do you find that to be very separate from dealing with veterinary care, or do you have aggressive dogs where you're also trying to teach them cooperative care? As soon as you have a dog with human directed aggression, the chance of them having veterinary phobia is very very high because they are dealing right. with strangers in their personal space. And so that is actually my my biggest specialty is dogs who have either been excused from a veterinary practice or have been told they can't come back until there's some training and muzzle training in place and things like that. And so I have um, clients from England to Hawaii, literally, and Australia, um, where they are, their dog is not capable of getting the proper veterinary care. And it's Having a dog who is aggressive in clinic really puts a barrier to care. So most of my clients, sure. before they seek out help, they really debate on, is it worthwhile to go to the clinic right now? Is my dog sick enough? And we shouldn't have to wait until they're sick enough to be able to go. And so it, it's a welfare issue for right. sure for all dogs, but especially our dogs with human directed aggression. Wow, I do. You, do you, I'm sure you must have some interesting stories or cases that 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 have proved challenging, and 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 I wondered if you'd like to tell us about any of them. Do we have the key, the video of the Vizsla? I will start with that one because that uh, is a. Gr is that the is that the ear medication or the sedation sedation the injection? Sed sedation. That's that's the sedation dog. Okay, that's video number two, right? Um, all right. I, I, I know I can't be heard when the video is playing. So if you said anything during the video, we yeah. didn't hear you, Sarah. But uh, that was fascinating to see. So that was, uh, tell, tell us what was going on there. Yeah. So that dog uh, started with his veterinary phobia for a very good reason. He, he sat on a thermometer 
and <laughs> nobody likes non-consensual butt touching. Um, <laughs> and so he sat on a thermometer and the next time the client brought him to the clinic, he was so stressed about the situation. He aggressed at the technician at the front door of the clinic. He didn't even make it into the clinic. So one's wow. trial learning of all the bad things. And this, the client is a long time confirmation agility person, had never had a dog with any veterinary issues before. And so that's why he doesn't, we traditionally, we would teach a dog that approaching, a person approaching is going to touch them. But Keeper is very, that's his biggest cue that th something's gonna go down bad is someone coming up from behind him. So he has this amazing backup skill and it's hard to see in the video, but he actually backs up until he lands on something. And in this case, it's the technician's feet. And so he was backing up and he put his feet, back feet on the technician's feet. That way the technician doesn't have to move. We, and so right. that's where being creative and really like that, that dog has an amazing chin rest, but having him do a chin rest with someone approaching from behind made him very concerned and suspicious. And so we do that instead. We do our chin rest for ear cleaning and if he, she needs to look in his mouth and things like that. Um, and that was the reason why I love, I kept the little end part where the client is giggling because you can, I'm not sure if you guys heard it, but she's like, really, that's it? Yeah. So the first time we went to, like we had done a ton of training before we even showed up in the clinic. The first time we went to the clinic, she now admits she almost threw up. She was so stressed and wow. so nervous and we weren't even doing anything. We were just doing a meet and greet with a vet, but that's how bad it was. And we have spent all this time working towards this. He has, um, he has a trained uh, blood draw that he does not need to be sedated for, but we wanted to get, you know, full body exam and mouth exam and everything. So that's why we did the sedated exam. Also, too, she travels a little bit for work and um, family. And so she he's with a dog sitter a lot. And so if any emergency were to arise and she ends up at a clinic and she does field training with him, that she needs to have a way to sedate this dog to get him care without our amazing right. staff at the veterinary clinic that we've, we've trained. Right. Well, you could tell that she was surprised that it was all over already. I mean, it was like uh, he just poked it in, gave the injection. And 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 as a guardian, she was not even aware that it had it actually happened. And that's right. sometimes kind of the best stuff. It was a very, you know, you don't usually think of a backup behavior as being a, a medical behavior. Right. But it's it's but it's a great creative use of 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 that. So I thought that was really great. Well, I, I don't want to run out of time and I want to be able to take some questions, but I, you yeah. sent a, you, you gave us another video that I wondered if you could set up before we show it. Sure. Yeah. So the other video is a uh, German Shepherd, Great Pyrenees mix. He has a lot of uh, physical issues. He has two bad hips, a bad elbow. Um, they believe he was hit by a car before the client rescued him. And um, his veterinary phobia started with an ear infection at his previous clinic and ear infections are horribly painful and he couldn't, they couldn't even get him sedated. He was so painful and reactive. And we had start, we've, we've muzzle trained him and we've been starting training, but we hadn't gotten to ear stuff yet. And he was showing signs of an infection. So we had to do really fast, like what could we do safely and creatively that we could get him some ear medication. We also discussed that even the client felt she was not comfortable putting in daily medication. So he got what's called Claro, which is goes in for a couple of weeks. Um, so also having that conversation of how can we treat this dog safely at home? Um, and so we put the same, we put the technician in a chair. We use the chair as a little bit of a safety net for the technician. He's muzzled. I was holding him because his the, the the owner is about 90 pounds wet. Um, so I was hanging out to him, but then she comes up, up and does the ear handling so that the technician can put the medication in. Okay, so this is, uh, the dog's name is Finn and this is video okay. number one. Let's watch.
you're going to come and flip his ear open. Good job, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Good job. Good job. What are we dropping? Right. Wow, that was interesting. I, I love, there's a lot of things about that that I thought was interesting. The use of the chair as a as a as a way of of, of partial restraint. Even the position that the vet tech was in, sitting on the chair and, and turning to the side, was a little bit creative. But at the same time, if it works, why not use it? I I, I think that was 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 really fascinating. Anything else about that case that you want to tell us about? Um. First of all, the client now can do ear handling even at home. Um, it's amazing how far we've come with that dog. Um, and the other thing I like to talk about with that is using the equipment that the dog already is wearing as restraint. So I, he was in a harness. He's in a rough wear harness that has a front clip or a back clip. And so all I did was add on the leash to on the front clip and I just step on it. And actually in the other V, the clip, the, the video with the Vizsla, um, also the same thing is using equipment that the dog is comfortable with. Instead of putting hands on the dog, we can change up some of that restraint need with just what they already have on their body. Wow, that's really, really great. I would love to bring Juliana on the screen because I'm sure um, not only does she have a lot of experience in training stuff like this, but I, she's also been paying attention to our, our chat window. And I've seen several people come in with questions and I wanted to make sure we got around to some of the questions. So Juliana, I'm going to turn it over to you and let, see what kind of questions we have for, for Sarah. You got it. First one, the dog house rules asks, does Sarah take the training to the vet's office? Does she have understanding vets where she can do that? Yeah. So with both of those video examples, that is actually the vet that I use myself. Um, but it is also, um, I do have a number of vets in the Portland area that I do this with. And I also have clients where we work on it remotely. So I, like I said, I have clients all over. And so I've had clients where they set up their, we zoom, I zoom in um, on their phone while they're at the clinic. Um, and yes, it is always tricky finding the vets that are willing to work with you. But you, when, once you let them realize that you're going to make their lives safer and easier, that's the that's the hook. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, that's great. That's wonderful. Does that? Would you say that makes a difference in success? The the how kind of on board that the vet is. I have worked with clinics that are less on board and the proof is in the pudding. And so all of a sudden they start seeing this dog that they couldn't touch before, or they, you know, if they saw it on their list of their clients for the day, they're like, Oh, it's going to be one of those days. And all of a sudden when they start seeing it, it really makes a difference. And they start to see the client's level of dedication. And as soon as they start to see the client putting in that much work, for their pet, they're w usually willing to put in the extra effort themselves. That's good. Great. And related to that, Anna is wondering, what is your elevator pitch to those vets? How do you, what do you say to try to get them on board? I really do try to, to use the elevator pitch of safety and less stress for them and the pet and the client. And those are the clients that are incredibly bonded to their clinic then. So they always talk about client retention in the veterinary clinics. And if you have a client that's you're willing to work with this way, they will never leave your clinic ever. Very compelling. Yeah, yeah. that's good. I like that. Um, you okay. Have, you have another question? Yes, engineering optimism dog training is wondering, can you talk about the difference between cooperative care and what you term care with consent? Excellent. Um, so the reason I stopped using the term cooperative care is I think 
there are times where we definitely train everything cooperatively. Um, I work with hands free and the dog can completely do a chin rest and do a blood draw. And it's amazing. The problem is what, especially when we're dealing with dogs with a history of aggression in the clinic and you tell a staff member that you are going to, no one's going to restrain this dog and we're going to do a blood draw. They are like, no, thank you. I'll see you later. And so we talk about care with consent with the idea of you can still teach restraint, you can still teach cooperation, and it can still be consenting. Just because you're restraining doesn't mean that there's not consent involved. And so that's in the video that I had with the shepherd mix is there was a ton of consent involved that if he didn't get between the wall and that chair, we weren't going to do anything. He also knew that he could back up and get out of it. And so I think so often in the trainer world, we, the, for me, the highest peak of the pyramid is cooperative care. I, I love it to be able to like have my dog be able to do a chin rest and do ear clean, all these things. But sometimes that's just not practical, either from a amount of training it's going to take or a safety perspective. And so that's why I call it care with consent. And just because you're doing restraint or you're using medications or both, I will say both of those dogs too in the videos were on um, pre-visit pharmaceuticals. Um, and so that's definitely part of the picture too. And, but they still are completely in consent of what is going on. So you would say then, Sarah, that, that cooperative care and care with consent are not mutually exclusive. There's, there's an overlap in them, but you approached it with the idea of care and consent because of that differentiation you just talked about. Yeah. And yeah, it, yes. Care with consent is cooperative care, but sometimes it's, you know, when you show a client that awesome video of, you know, my dog doing a jugular blood draw with just a chin rest and nothing else being held, they see that and they shut down. They're like, well, I'll never be able to train that. And right. it's like, okay, that's yeah. yeah. So we're going to work on what can we train? And it's okay that we do a little bit of, you know, restraint or we teach, but I still, even if there's restraint, there's still consent and it's still taught. Right. Everything about it is still taught. Yeah. I, I like that. And I like the fact that there's that spectrum of, well, yes, it would be great if you got every animal to be able to voluntarily present a body part and take a blood sample, but that isn't realistic. That isn't always possible. And being able to look at it from a couple of different levels and a couple of different perspectives to see that training is still a very valuable tool to get you where you need to be, I think is a really helpful lesson. Juliana, what else do we have uh, question wise? Anna is asking, um, she said, beautiful examples. Can you talk a bit about interim steps to prepare dogs for handling by strangers and vet staff? Do you play the vet staff or do you recruit strangers to help with the training at all? Yeah. So we, I do, I usually have it in phases. So client first is at home doing it themselves and they will teach all of the, I do a lot of predictor cues um, that the Vigla had tons of predictor cues built in there that we didn't really talk about. Um, so I do a lot about predictability and I have the clients teach that at home with just themselves who the dog is most comfortable with. Then if the dog has somebody within their inner circle, I sometimes have dogs that only have maybe one or two people in their inner circle that allow them to get close. And so we'll start with those people. And then we work on just being comfortable at the clinic before we can even ask vet staff to do anything. And then um, with both of those two dogs at the clinic that I go to, they do a, we can have a tech visit. They have to pay for it because guess what? People need to have their time covered. And so we pay for a tech visit to practice. And the, we do the visa, we go every month, uh, probably for the rest of his life. The client is very well aware to keep up his skills. And she is, so once a month we go and we practice with them. Um, clients will get, you know, family members, neighbors. The biggest thing is making sure that whoever you're asking to rope into your training listens very specifically to your directions and does not go off script. <laughs> I think that's a really valuable thing to say because it isn't hard to get usually uh, uh, someone in your family or a friend to help you. But so often people are so 
comfortable around dogs that they just take the liberty of doing other things that right. you weren't intending. Right. And I suppose that that could really set your training back if the dog's not prepared for that. It also happens in clinic. I, I will never forget walking into an emergency clinic with my dog Rizzo. I was holding her muzzle in my hand because I was just walking in. She didn't need it in the in the waiting room. And I was not expecting the technician to come up and do a triage of her in the waiting room and started touching her while I'm holding a muzzle. I mean, luckily she had a lot of training and by that point and she was really not feeling well that day. So it went fine, but you also have to be aware of technicians who have grabby hands too. Yeah. That's, that's, that's scary mm -hmm. to, to think they didn't yeah. think to ask if it's okay and, and get permission. I was standing there with a muzzle in my hand. <laughs> wow. Any other questions, Juliana? Leslie is asking for the examples you showed, how long did it take to get to that point? I think people are always wondering about timelines. Yeah. yeah. Um, so our the Vijla, I've been um we've been working together for I mean at, for that sedated exam, it probably was a probably a year and a half to almost two years, I will say. I'll admit it. Um, but that was during COVID too. We started doing just online sessions in during COVID times. So a little longer probably than would be normal. But before we even did his sedated exam, we had trained him up for a um, side laying down unrestrained blood draw. So he, that like, that was different, you know, we, he can do all sorts of other things too. Um, for Finn, the shepherd mix, I've only been working with him on and off for probably maybe five or six months, um, but not as consistently. So we tend to go a, a good chunk of time where we won't see each other. Um, and so, but uh, muzzle training him was our, our biggest jump first. And that took probably about a month or so before he was really comfortable with his muzzle and being able to know that we could take it in clinic. No, that's great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to call Sarah's attention to some comments that came into the chat window. Anna, Anna said, thank you for your clear walkthrough. You seem like an awesome teacher. And then, uh, uh, can you, and then uh, engineering, I don't see the whole title, but that was a long one that asked a question earlier says she is, I can attest worth her weight in gold. They said, so I thought <laughs> you'd want to hear that. And I think that's a great, a great testament to the kind of, of classes that you teach. And we're very pleased that at KPA that you've come on board to teach this class for us in our live classes that are coming up soon. So I encourage people to, to look into it. And I really thank Sarah so much for being with us today. We are almost out of time. And before we go, I want to take a few minutes to to remind people about a couple of upcoming things about episodes of the future. But Sarah, thanks so much for being here today. And I want to remind everybody that next month on our broadcast uh, live from the ranch, our guest is going to be uh, Camilla Chu. And she is going to be talking about an interesting topic, unlocking the power of public speaking skills through successive approximations. And I got to tell you, this was a topic that I was skeptical about at first. But once I started meeting with Camilla, and hearing her talk about the way she uses successive approximations to teach people about public speaking and how those public speaking skills can help you as a trainer, can help you in life, I think you'll get a lot from this episode. So don't hesitate to join me uh, for our September broadcast. I can't believe it's September, going to be September already, but for our September broadcast of Live from the Ranch with Camilla Chu. We also want to remind you that if you have suggestions for us or ideas that you'd like to, to present as possible future topics or ideas for Live from the Ranch, don't hesitate to put them in the suggestion box. If you go to theranch.clickertraining.com and go to the live button, you'll see a form that you can fill out to submit videos for us, to give us suggestions, all sorts of ideas. And finally, before you go, we want to remind you of the various offers that we presented to you today uh, from Karen Pryor Clicker Training. First of all, the Clicker Expo Live 
and the Clicker Expo Portland conferences. Uh, those are coming up. What's most important is that our early bird special, our early bird savings is going to take place. And we open that for registration on August 17th. So that's just a couple of weeks away. So start planning for your, your trip to Portland or your opportunity to block off those dates in January for our virtual live conference. And of course, all of you are, if you're interested in becoming a professional trainer and you're interested in Karen Pryor Academy, we have lots of fun classes for you. You should check those out. And of course, we just finished talking with Sarah McLeodry. She's offering her class, but first fun, cooperative care training with Sarah McLeodry. That enrollment opens at the end of the month. I have enjoyed having this, this conversation. It just sort of flew by. I hope all of you have enjoyed the con uh, the conversation as well. Tell your friends about the broadcast. Have them check us out on YouTube and uh, on our YouTube channel. And I thank uh, Juliana for being a co-host. And I thank all of you for being here. Happy training. We'll see you next month. All right.